It's Disruptive FM. It's Disruptive FM. Disruptive FM. Welcome to Disruptive FM, where business and culture collide. Sponsored by Microsoft and Branding Strategy Insider. With your host, Jeffrey Colon. Okay, here we go. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's another episode of Disruptive FM, number 18, for the week ending Friday, the 7th of September, 2018. Do you remember the 21st night of September? Welcome. I'm Jeffrey Cologne, your host and audio guide for the next quarter hour as we dive into the culture of business and check out what's happening in marketing, media, tech, and popular culture. Cross the fader. Here are this week's trending topics. We've been highlighting a pulse no other business radio show has talked about at all this year. About 34 years ago, a little company named Apple ushered in a life-changing television ad campaign centered around the theme of 1984. Nothing has touched it since. Many copycats tried to recreate business movements, but nothing has come close until now. Another little company just north of Apple's headquarters in Beaverton, Oregon, called Nike, has ushered in the era of corporate political activism with its 30th anniversary Just Do It campaign featuring ostracized NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick. Kaepernick has wanted to call attention to police brutality and started doing that by taking a knee during the national anthem in pregames. But then something happened. No longer part of the league, other players followed suit and have kept this movement and momentum alive. It is highly unlikely Colin will play again in the NFL. But does that matter? He's created a movement. And of course, Nike has pounced on it to its advantage using this insight. 90% of consumers aged 18 to 36 want to support companies in which they have an aligned moral belief system. Gen Z is aligned with political activism. And this move most likely is Nike's way of rebooting to matter to this younger generation who may have lately started donning competitor wear from the likes of Adidas, Puma, and Under Armour. So far, this new campaign has generated 116 million earned impressions. A huge boon for Nike, who used to pay tons of paid media to get heard. Nike has always supported unique athletes not celebrated by the mainstream. Prefontaine, Michael Jordan when Air Jordans were banned by the NBA. Serena Williams when tennis fans booed her because she didn't fit the identity of a pro tennis player. Muhammad Ali in their heritage collection. The list goes on and on and on and on. So what does this campaign mean for the brand? And is it all good, sound strategy? We like to be objective and well-rounded here at DFM and get all the sides of the issues. And this is why we turn to our contributor at large, Cheryl Barbie. Cheryl is now Senior Vice President of Strategy at FCB in Chicago, which is part of the Interpublic Group. Here's what Cheryl had to say about the hottest topic since Oreo dunked it in the dark at the Super Bowl when we spoke to her earlier this week via Skype. What an interesting move from Nike, right? It certainly blew up social media. There are a lot of people who have already sort of dissected why they might do it. So we all know that the demographics that they want to target, young, not even millennials, but really Gen Z, we know that they're diverse. We know that they're politically active. We know activism is something close to their hearts. We also know social media is a place where they're looking for, you know, like-minded perspectives. We know that brands that take action are really popular now. So it makes perfect sense in terms of doubling down on the demographics that they want to get loyalty from. And I think we also all know that Nike is trying to spark conversation. And they knew that this was going to be bold. They knew it was going to be provocative. They knew it was going to be risk taking. And they felt like that risk taking aligns with their brand and maybe even refreshes their brand a little bit. Maybe they felt it was 
too safe for a long time. And this provocative tone feels ballsy, frankly, when you take a risk comes across as authentic. And we all know authenticity also is really attractive, especially to younger audiences. So it really makes a lot of sense in terms of the hearts and minds of the young audiences that they're targeting. But I think that there are pros and cons to what they did. And I would say the first con that comes to mind to me is not so much a loss that Nike experiences, but I think a loss for brand strategy. And what I mean by that is our culture is so politicized that it's reaching a turning point, a tipping point. People want nothing more than to escape the pervasive politicization of absolutely everything that we experience. And sports is one of those areas where politics increasingly is, you know, one in the same for Nike to take this provocative approach that pits people against each other, that frankly inflames anger I don't know that that's a good model for everyone to now imitate. I feel like that only makes things worse. It only exacerbates the problem. I don't know either whether it's a a good long-term strategy. Provocative is good for PR, but provocative is not necessarily good for loyalty. That was DFM's contributor at large, Cheryl Barbie, Senior Vice President of Strategy at FCB in Chicago with her take on the new Nike Just Do It 30th anniversary campaign, causing a whole lot of noise out there on socials. Thanks again, Cheryl. Trending Topics on DFM. The Senate still isn't done with Facebook, Twitter, or Google. So this past week, they summoned all three to show up on Capitol Hill to testify if their platforms were involved in illegal election activity by third parties. In the latest congressional hearings on misinformation and election interference, which featured first-time appearances by Facebook Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg and Twitter Chief Executive Officer Jack Dorsey, the companies committed to trying to get better at explaining how their automated systems work to serve up, sort, and block content on their social networks, and how they spot material that needs to be removed. Facebook and Twitter have drawn vast audiences and built their businesses for years by touting themselves as open forums for debate and free expression. Yet their revenue has mainly depended on opaque ad targeting and data collection practices. As they work to become more open and satisfy lawmakers' demands, the companies are walking a fine line, pledging to improve transparency while stopping short of promising they can solve the problems that made the hearings necessary to begin with, such as abuse, misinformation, trolling, and manipulation. The companies have heard many of Wednesday's questions before, but several new lines of inquiry emerged. Members of the Senate Intelligence Committee asked, for example, why the companies can't let users know when they're talking to a bot an automated account, as opposed to a human, as a way to expose foreign activity. Yet Dorsey struggled to explain how the company was approaching its problems. When asked how many people he employs to moderate content, he fumbled. He didn't really have an answer. He said he would get back to the committee with more information later. Technical jargon and talk from Dorsey about the hundreds of signals that contribute to content decisions also occasionally frustrated some members of Congress, which has long pushed for the platforms to become easier for consumers to understand. And this is the big issue. Nobody really understands the vagueness of these platforms in their leadership. Nobody really knows what they offer anymore except a bunch of noise. And noise leads to hearing loss. Nobody wants that. All it takes is a dip in usership, and these platforms are pretty much in the dustbin like a cheap $2 CD from 1991 from some band nobody remembers. It can happen, people. It may already be happening. Maybe someone will write a song one day that goes like this. Here's a little ditty about Jack and Cheryl, two kids growing up and fleeing the coast for the heartland. Trending Topics on DFM. Theranos and its leader, Elizabeth Holmes. Some tech journalists compared her to Steve Jobs. 
Now the company has been broken up because it's the biggest fraud to ever come out of Silicon Valley. The blood testing startup whose former top executives are accused of carrying out a massive years long fraud. Well, it's shutting down immediately. David Taylor, who became CEO in June, said Theranos will be dissolved after it attempts to pay creditors with its remaining cash. Because the company's cash is not nearly sufficient to pay all of its creditors in full, there will be no distribution to shareholders. Under founder and now former CEO Elizabeth Holmes, Theranos raised more than $700 million from investors and was one time valued at $9 billion at its peak. Holmes had claimed that the company's technology could run comprehensive lab tests using just a few drops of blood, a pitch that appealed to Walgreens, which partnered with Theranos to offer the blood tests in its stores. Instead, in a criminal indictment, the Justice Department says that Holmes and her then-boyfriend, former president and COO Ramesh Sunny Bawani perpetrated a multi-million dollar pyramid scheme to defraud investors and a separate scheme to defraud doctors and patients. They each face nine counts of wire fraud and two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. Maybe Taylor Swift needs to dedicate her song Bad Blood to Holmes and Bawani at her next concert. You are listening to Disruptive FM with Jeffrey Cologne. Now, here comes the music. Here comes the music. Here comes the music. It's Disruptive FM, the culture of business. I'm your host, Jeffrey Cologne. In the background, that's new music from Danny Bird. Smooth liquid drum and bass from his latest album, Atomic Funk. It's a track called I Dragon. Out now on Hospital Records. You can connect with us on Instagram or Twitter at Disruptive FM. Connect with me personally on Instagram or Twitter at DJGEOFFE. Also, check out our latest Volume 1 mixtape on Spotify titled BK Block Party. Disruptive FM is brought to you by Microsoft and Branding Strategy Insider. For more in-depth analysis, check out Microsoft.com slash stories and BrandingStrategyInsider.com. Also brought to you by Iographer. Create better video. At Iographer, they make accessories for your mobile device to help you make professional videos. Learn more about all the products we use at DFM to make our videos at iographer.com. And now, DFM presents... Do you even read, bro? It's called reading. Top to bottom, left to right. Group words together as a sentence. Book reviews for disruptive minds. So Labor Day was this past week in the States, and that means diagnosing labor and work as we know it. So it caught my attention that there's this great book out there called, wait for it, Bullshit Jobs by anthropologist David Graeber. Here's why you need to read it. From best-selling writer David Graeber, who also wrote the book called Debt, a powerful argument against the rise of meaningless, unfulfilling jobs and their consequences. Does your job make a meaningful contribution to the world? In the spring of 2013, Graeber asked this question in a playful, provocative essay titled On the Phenomenon of Bullshit Jobs. Of course, it went viral. After a million online views in 17 different languages, people all over the world are still debating the answer. There are millions of people, human resource consultants, communication coordinators, telemarketing researchers, corporate lawyers, Heck, marketers, whose jobs are useless, and tragically, they know it. These people are caught in bullshit jobs. Graeber explores one of society's most vexing and deeply felt concerns, indicting among other villains a particular strain of finance capitalism that betrays ideals shared by thinkers ranging from Keynes to Lincoln. 
Bullshit Jobs gives individuals, corporations, and societies permission to undergo a shift in values, placing creative and caring work at the center of our culture, which right now is pretty much demeaned to the bottom of our culture. This book is for everyone who wants to turn their vocation back into an avocation. Available where all good books are sold. It's about that time to take a look at some simmering news items we have an eye on. It's a segment we call On the Radar. Here's what's on our radar. Here's what's on our radar. Number one. The enlightenment and the rise of market capitalism transformed Western culture yet again. Individualism became the dominant ethos, with self-fulfillment and personal authenticity the highest goods. Happiness became a fundamental right, something to which we're entitled as human beings. There's this new book entitled The Happiness Fantasy by Carl Cedarstrom, a business professor at Stockholm University, who traces our current conception of happiness to its roots in modern psychiatry and the so-called beat generation of the 1950s and 1960s. He argues that the values of the counterculture movement liberation, freedom, and authenticity were co-opted by corporations and advertisers who used them to perpetrate a culture of consumption and production. And that hyper-individualistic culture actually makes us much less happy than we could be. Number two. What's the germiest part of the airport for our frequent flyers who are listening to DFM right now on their headphones as they travel? Those trays at airport security have more viruses than public toilets, reports The Independent. That's according to a study from the Finnish National Institute for Health and Welfare and Nottingham University, in which multiple surfaces at Helsinki Airport were swabbed during the winter of 2016. Of all the areas tested, including escalator handrails, passport checking counters, and children's play areas, the greatest number of viruses most commonly rhinovirus, but also influenza A, were found in the plastic security trays. This is so bad that it was noted no respiratory viruses were detected in the toilets. Number three. Here's something to think about. AI is the next pop star. Every time a new technology is introduced and that tectonically shifts the way we create music, there are naysayers. Things like auto-tune, the use of samples and loops and digital audio workstations were all disruptors that we adapted to and are now commonplace tools and methods. Well, AI is next. The technology's impact on the music industry as a whole remains to be seen. Will it destroy jobs? How will it affect musical copyright? Will it ever be able to work without a human? Sure, an algorithm making music sounds scary because it mirrors human capabilities that we already find mysterious. But it's also a compelling tool that can enhance said human capabilities. AI as a collaborator increases access to music making. It can streamline workflows. And it provides the spark of inspiration needed to craft your next hit single. We'll feature some AI produced tunes here on DFM soon. All right, that will wrap our 18th episode of DFM. We're officially adults. Big thanks to our contributor at large, Cheryl Barbie, for joining us. You can connect with us by following me on Twitter or Instagram at DJ GEO FFE. Follow Disruptive FM on Twitter or Instagram at Disruptive FM. And you can read more in-depth content via our three sponsors, Microsoft.com slash stories, BrandingStrategyInsider.com, and Iographer.com. Next week, well, we've got a surprise for you. So make sure you tune in. Just think about Advertising Week New York. And maybe that will give you a hint. All right, for everyone here at DFM, thanks for checking us out. We appreciate your time. I'm Jeffrey Cologne. We'll catch you next week. You've been listening to Disruptive FM with Microsoft Communications designer Jeffrey Cologne. All thoughts are his own. Disruptive FM is produced in Los Angeles by Feeler Media.